Warning, the following contains explicit language and subject matter that may not be suitable for younger listeners, church folk, and people who enjoy kale smoothies. to a pot amongst men i'm your host steve b and this is coffee break conversations for the 21st century my guest this week is dr john shinnerer call him dr john he is a phd in educational psychology i'm pretty sure i'm remembering that correctly but uh dr john is the host of the evolved caveman podcast and i have him on here today just to talk about all these challenges facing men today and you know, some things we could do to better ourselves and improve our own lives and our own standing in, you know, in the world of 2020. So I I have to say this. I really, really, really enjoy doing this episode, and I'm really proud of it. I, there is such good information in here, and I really encourage everybody to, to listen closely and absorb everything you can from this because, you know, Dr. John's a smart dude, and there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of great advice in here. So, without further ado, here is my episode with Dr. John. I feel like it is. All right, so yeah, first off, thank you very much for doing this. It's nice to to actually meet you. My pleasure. Uh why don't you give the uh, the listeners a little bit of introduction as to who you are, you know, where you're from, how you came up, what your area of expertise is. Okay, let's see. Oh, boy, that's a long story. Um got a lot of years <laughs> we- now. We got time. Oh, by the way, you don't have to be out of here. Are you, are you under a time limit or anything? Okay, no. good. Um, so let's see. My name is Dr. John Schinnerer. Um, I started out as kind of a competitive, overachieving little shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, my parents were hard driving and overachieving, so I think I learned to be the same in order to get their attention and their love from my you know, childlike perspective. But it ended up with me being, um, I don't know, I was doing it all as a senior in high school. So I was student body president. I was captain of three varsity teams. I was taking AP classes. I was doing everything the adults told me that I needed to do to be, quote, successful. Okay. It sure sounds like it. (laughs) It it looked great from the outside, right? They're like, people are like, ooh, wow, look at him. And, you know, parents were like, why aren't you like him? And, And I think from the inside, my experience was... I was depressed part of the time. I was anxious a lot of the time. I was stressed all the time. I was exhausted most of the time. I was getting sick a lot because I was just busting my balls. And it it really made me start questioning this concept of success. Because my question was, where is there room in this for things like happiness or contentment or relaxation? Mm -hmm. Because all I saw was I was just killing myself to get everything done. And and it was really a, a great experience in hindsight because it did, you know, force me to question those things. And I didn't have any answers at the time, but it, it caused me to start questioning. And, it, yeah. you know, it worked. I got into a great college, um, eventually ended up going to UC Berkeley to get a PhD in psychology. Um, <laughs> and, and the reason I went into psychology was because I knew I was a smart young man that that mm-hmm. really wasn't a question i'd always gotten good grades and i could learn things quickly where i struggled was emotionally you know if i look back it's like the the dumbest most embarrassing most shameful shit i've done in my life was when my emotional mind was in charge of me you know anger fear excitement boredom sometimes mm-hmm. um and I, I was laughing when i was thinking about berkeley because i got into uc berkeley i was at new student orientation and I found myself in, and so there's five people in my whole class. Like that's how big my class was. And I found myself at new student orientation in a conversation with a seventh year student, which means he'd been in a PhD program at Cal for seven years. Wow. And really doing the Van Wilder thing, huh? (laughs) But this was, I mean, like this guy was like smart at a level, even the professors were kind of struggling to understand. Mm -hmm. And so I, the only thing I could think to say was, so what's your dissertation on? (laughs) <laughs> and he started talking and after about eight words out of his mouth 
this guy could have been speaking Martian. I, I had no idea what he was saying. And all of a sudden the thoughts started coming. You're not worthy. You don't belong here. You're not smart enough. And immediately constriction in the throat, tightness in the chest, perspiration. Um, you know, my, my only thought was I got to get the hell out of here. That feeling of being in over your and, head, right? And it was a panic attack, right? I didn't know mm -hmm. it at the time, but um, you know, I, I actually had to go to the bathroom and take my shirt off because I was sweating <laughs> so profusely. I'm like fanning my shirt in the stall to try and dry it off. I'm like, what the fuck was that? Oh, can I swear <laughs> on here? What, how, how oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, just checking. <laughs> um, so that was my first panic attack. And you know, part of my makeup is I got a little depression. Part of it is I got a little anxiety. So mm -hmm. that was partly why I got into psychology in the first place was to try and learn how to manage that. Um, and you know, Cal's all about cognitive psychology. So it's about how do we think, which was great. I, I wanted the Cal name behind me because I knew I wanted to go more into the emotional side of things. Mm -hmm. And to do that at the time, I needed a, a really solid name behind me. Because emotions are really hard to study. Um, they're squishy, they're soft, they're hard to measure. Um, and so I, I went and I became a school psychologist. And the best part of the job was meeting with students and counseling them. Mm -hmm. So I remember I was in a high school in Fremont and I've got high school students coming through and they're sharing their stories with me. And their stories were filled with anger, fear, sadness, guilt, shame, and rightfully so. They were dealing with some really heavy stuff. And I mean, yeah, gang violence, teen pregnancy, worried about getting jumped on the way home, alcoholic parents, you name it. And yeah. I didn't know at the time that emotions are contagious. So I started picking up their emotions because that's what I do. I'm empathic. And it ended up with me getting depressed. And when we get depressed, inflammation in our body goes up. So all the old injuries that you've experienced, many of them will come back. And for me, it's low back. So my low back goes out, I'm in pain, I'm depressed. You know, you can kind of feel the, the walls of, of hope closing. Mm -hmm. And I remember laying on my floor thinking, this is ridiculous. Like here I am a psych trained to Cal and I still can't manage my own emotions. If I can't do it, how can I teach them to? And so at that point, I made a conscious decision to find the best scientifically proven tools because that was important to me to manage that darker side of things, fear, anger, mm -hmm. sadness, guilt, shame, negative thoughts, that kind of thing. And I, I went on a quest and, and found these things and that was really helpful. That was part of the puzzle. Um, in the meantime, I left and did an entrepreneurial venture uh, doing pre-employment testing for large companies, which worked well for about seven years. 2007, 2008 came, the economy crashed, no one needed pre-employment testing. Um, so I, I got depressed again when my company went up in flames. And then you have thoughts of, you know, I'm not a good enough father. I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not a good enough man. Um, and at that time, after I pulled myself out of the emotional rubble, I discovered positive psychology. And I started reading like hundreds of studies in positive psychology, which is basically the scientific study of happiness. That's kind of the short version. But okay. Um, more in depth is it's the scientific study of positive emotions, of meaning, of purpose, of hope, of why you should care about positive emotions. What do they do for us? Um, it's about how to get more engaged in life. It's about how to get more motivated. And it was like, at the time, it was like manna from heaven. It was like, oh my God, like now I've got tools for the negative and tools for the positive. This is really powerful. So I kind of compulsively started writing this framework for how to coach people towards a successful and happy life. Because now I had the piece that I was missing when I was 17. And then I happened to go to a Christian business networking breakfast, which is kind of a weird place for me because I consider myself spiritual, but I'm not crazy about organized mm -hmm. religion. Yeah. Um, and I, I happened to sit next to a guy who owned a radio station uh, in the Bay Area. We started talking. Um, we met a few times and he said, John, I want to put you on the radio. And That's I thought, a great radio voice already. <laughs> oh shit. I, I mean, I was, I was scared because this was a daily live primetime radio show in the Bay area where the radio signal reached 10 million people. And you know, to them, that, those were all selling points to me. I was like, yeah. oh. <laughs> you know, I was, I was scared shitless, but I also have known since I was 16 that if I'm scared of something, I have to go after it because that's the best way to deal with the fear. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, fuck, okay, I'll 
I'll do the radio show. <laughs> and so I did it. And honestly, I was pretty shitty at the beginning because I, I couldn't, couldn't tell a story, couldn't emote, couldn't tell a joke, was kind of stuck on research. So I was more in my head than in my heart. Mm -hmm. And slowly I started to get better at it. And slowly I started to relax into it. And then I got to begin interviewing experts and then world experts. And I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing. Like I'm learning as I'm doing this, not only radio, but psychology. Mm -hmm. And did that for about uh, 200 shows, stopped it after a year and published part of the book, opened up a private practice. And I wanted to initially do positive psychology, but it, that was 2000, I don't know, eight, 2007. And the response to positive psychology was pretty lukewarm. So that led me to get into anger management uh, on the suggestion of a psychiatrist friend of mine. And then things started taking off. So I started working with men, uh, adolescents and adult males, um, did that for about 10 years. And that work gets a little tiring after a time because mm -hmm. it's hard to have adolescent males come in and be like, I don't want to be here. I'm not going to listen to anything you have to say. And I'm out after one session. And that's, that was pretty common. And I was mm -hmm. good at flipping them at being kind of, you know, quote, cool and, and connecting with them and showing them there was something for them here. But I couldn't, it was harder to get them to practice the tools outside of the office. And so then I started shifting more to adult males, which was better. But then I started shifting to executive coaching and working more with men, businessmen and executives. And that's where things really started to connect or click because these were men that wanted to learn. And I found that if I had clients that were open to the idea of learning and serious about practicing, not even all the tools, some of the tools, mm -hmm. tremendous growth would ensue. Um, and so I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then I realized that a lot of the clients that I had, I mean, I've got a range of clients, but some of the clients that I had were worth, to me, ridiculous amounts of money, 200, 400, $600 million. And I realized that they were doing great at work for the most part, but where they were really struggling was at home with their spouses and their kids who are now teenagers. And it struck me that the the value that they started out with, which is a good value, in other, in other words, to provide for the family, mm -hmm. got twisted and morphed over 15, 20 years. And their natural competitiveness came through, their ego came through, you know, I think it felt good. And they just got caught up in climbing the hierarchy and making more money so that they could buy more things for themselves and their family. It's like those but, virtues that got them to where they are eventually yeah. become vices almost. They got cancerous. Um, yeah. And at that point, then the wife is annoyed and irritated because there's no time or attention for her, assuming a heterosexual relationship. The teenage kids were angry because dad was never around. He was a workaholic. And I realized that they were having trouble in their personal relationship. So I shifted more to relationship skills and coaching them on how to connect better with their family. Mm -hmm. And that led to more recent work on masculinity and the man box culture. And that shit just fascinates the hell out of me because how we're socialized as young boys, I think impacts everything we're doing as men. Absolutely. I, I agree. And it's, that's an interesting thing is that you're talking about these, you know, executives and, you know, higher up guys making lots of money every year they're having the same problems that guys all the way down the ladder are having. I mean, for instance, I work in construction, and this is something I've seen time and time again. Guys, they're working, 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 you know, day and night, working overtime, trying to start a side business, and they spend their whole life working because they feel like they're providing for their family. But at the end, that's the thing that bites them in the ass, so, right. so to speak. You know, and they've spent their whole life working away from their family to give them stuff when all maybe their family wanted was more time with dad and more time with their husband. And... It's, right. And, and, and I think it becomes cancerous. You know, one of the problems is that none of these men, or I should say all these men have very good hearts and values. The problem is that we're fed a rash of bullshit when we're younger. I, I mean, the, the story that we're fed is get good grades, get to the best college you can, get the best job you can, make the most money you can, find someone to marry, get married, have kids, make more money, get promoted, make more money, retire eventually, and then you'll be happy. Yeah. 
and it doesn't work that way. And all these guys, the biggest mistake they've done is believe what they were told at a younger age. And I think what they were told at a younger age is just wrong. Well, that's that's really kind of what I like to get into on the show. Not it's what it's essentially about is that a lot of the ways that we were socialized, we were raised as men, a lot of the things we were taught maybe once applied to a, you know a time that's long since passed. But the world today that we live in in 2020, a lot of those messages and a lot of those lessons just don't apply anymore. So yeah. we as men are ill prepared to to just to live and operate in this society and even as fathers to raise kids that for a world that we just don't understand simply yeah you know yeah, well put so, yeah well um man box culture uh if you could could you give the listeners a definition because this is you know kind of the main crux of this episode i think is that sure um so let's go back to the 1970s um, so I think, you know, well, if we go back to the 1950s, which is where, you know, I think half our country wants to go back to right now, but in the 1950s, you know, the man was the provider, he was married to a woman and the roles were very clear cut. Then fast forward to the 1970s, female empowerment becomes more prominent. Feminism becomes a bigger deal. Women's liberation and women are starting to get into the workforce more and more and more. So now women have access to their own funds, their own money. And now women don't need us as much, us men as much for the financial piece of marriage, which for hundreds of years, that was the primary function of marriage. It was a financial arrangement. All of a sudden in the seventies, that's no longer true. So women now have their own finances and now the, the expectations by women of men, for what a husband should be. The rules of being a husband have changed. The problem is nobody told us men. <laughs> now this, this shift happens over you know tens of years, but where it used to be okay, like when my dad was growing, when he was, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago when he was younger, um, it was okay to be a good provider for your family, to not drink too much, to not do drugs, and to not be emotionally or physically abusive. That's it. That was a good husband, a good father. And, and my dad did that very well. He was a great provider for the family. Mm -hmm. and, and he's a great man. But that was the expectation. So if that's the expectation, that's all you got to do. But now the expectations have changed. And the expectations that many women have of their partner is they want a lifelong romantic partner. Because the finances are less important, the other side, the social and emotional piece has become much more important. And so they want a partner that can communicate, that can listen, that can be empathetic, sympathetic, and supportive. And, you know, right now in the U.S., women are responsible for initiating 75% of the divorces. And the biggest complaint I hear is I can't connect with my husband. Yeah, uh, communication. That's what the number one thing that everybody's going to tell you yeah. to make a relationship work. And I like to say that so far, me and my wife are living proof of that because just taking a breath and thinking, maybe double checking what you were going to say, having that little filter. Don't just say the first thing that comes to your uh, mouth. Yeah, you know that that communication and just being thoughtful of maybe how your partner is going to receive that. That goes such a long way, and it's helped me endlessly in my relationship you know you're absolutely right it was interesting i was interviewing dan tomasolo who's the author of learned hopefulness and he's high up in the positive psychology movement so i have a i have a lot of respect for him he was saying that one of the biggest things we can do is multiple times throughout the day just stop take a breath and ask ask yourself what am i feeling right now and why and here's the interesting thing is that that pause it allows you to respond to your environment rather than react emotionally. And it, it, it helps with self-regulation, which is probably one of the most important skills we can learn in this lifetime. And here's the kicker. The answer to that question doesn't matter. What matters is asking the question. And that's kind of mind blowing to me. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things, the destination's not important. It's the journey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true of happiness. Yeah, no, that's um, so, so. So, sorry, I was I was leading up to the man box. That was kind of the the, the foundation. Um, so, the man box culture, the way that we are socialized as men, going back to 
this starts really early, like pre-kindergarten, so at the age of four or five. And if you think of, um, you know, a, a group of five boys hanging out together, and one boy likes a little girl in his kindergarten class. So he tells the other boys, you know, I, I think Sally's really cute. I, I'm going to give her a flower. Usually there's another boy in the group, and, and often he's kind of the, the future alpha male, and he will say something like, dude, don't be such a girl. Hmm. And you learn immediately like, oh, I don't want to do that again because that felt bad. Being so a girl is lesser than. Is bad. Yeah. And it yeah. makes me feel bad internally, right? There's shame, there's anger, there's sadness. You know, there's, there's these emotions that connected with it. And then you fast forward to middle school and high school. And what happens is, we, we internalize these rules from typically from hanging out with our friends, could be other male peers, could be sports coaches, could be teachers, definitely social media and what we watch on TV and movies. But we learn these rules. And, and this actually came from work by Paul Kivel in Oakland, where he went and asked middle and high school boys, young men, what does it mean to be a man? And then found that there was all these similarities in the answers, so things like be invulnerable, be invincible, um, be self-reliant, don't feel, dominate women, be aggressive, don't back down, don't ask for help, things like that. And then what happens is we, we internalize these rules. And the other part of it is that when we show emotion, we get hammered for it. So for instance, if I'm in high school and I show too much sadness or fear, someone usually will say something like, dude, don't be such a pussy, or don't be a, don't be a little bitch, or don't be a girl. And then if I show too much on the other side of the spectrum, like too much excitement, joy, love, romanticism, someone will say something like, don't be a fag, don't be so gay. And I apologize for the, the use of those, but that, that's what we get, honestly. No, you're and 100% every time right. You, and, and they change. I mean, like you can get different insults, but what happens yeah. is when you get that insult, you jump back into the man box and you go, shit, like I'm not going to do that again because that hurt. Like I don't, I don't like being embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So you learn after a few of these what you can show or demonstrate publicly without fear of humiliation. And we're left with, I would argue, three emotions. So there's lust, she's so hot, I'd do her. There's stress, oh my God, I am so stressed, like I am so busy right now. The implication being I'm important. And the big one, anger, some degree of anger. So a lot of our emotions get funneled through that anger lens and they come out as, irritability, annoyance, frustration, rage. And I, we know like depression in men typically comes out as irritability. Mm -hmm. We know, I know I've talked to a lot of men and I've seen embarrassment come out as anger. I've seen guilt and shame come out as anger. I've seen anxiety come out as anger. It, that's what we can show without anyone insulting us. And, and so what happens is we, we get fast forward, we get into a relationship and our wives are saying, I, I don't know, I can't connect with my husband. He just seems kind of irritable all the time. So it, it's not really our fault because we didn't ask to be socialized that way. And I would argue it is our responsibility to learn ways to evolve out of that man box, to step out of the yes. game, to realize the game for what it is and call it. I mean, I remember <laughs> I was at a, a punk rock concert with my friend who... Do you, do you I, remember I, I which was, band? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was um, Offspring. So it was actually okay. a festival. It was a festival in Sacramento. So it was a whole day of, um, of bands and offspring headlined. And so it was later in the evening and, you know, mosh pits were springing up all over. That's and my friend, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My friend is like 6'3", 240, like big dude, much bigger than me. And, and he's really into concerts more so than I am and I'm into him. But we're standing at the edge of a mosh pit and he's like, dude, Get in the mosh pit. Okay, now bear in mind, I'm 50 years old at this point. <laughs> and so is he. Dude, get in the mosh pit. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Dude, get in the mosh pit. No, no, I'm fine. Pussy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and I just laughed, right? Because I'm like, I know the game. I know it for what it is. So when that happens, I can laugh at it and just step outside of it and go, oh, there it is. Yep. It's kind of like being Neo with the Matrix. You see the code yeah. behind everything. But I'm 50 kinda... and I'm still getting this shit. I could, like, I was just laughing. Yeah, it never stops. It never no. stops. I mean, hell, I have, I have a couple good mosh pit stories <laughs> exactly like that, you know? Yeah. But uh, 
Yeah, that the man box. That's like that that set of rules, almost like that invisible set of rules that we all learn, and we say, "Listen, don't step out of, don't step over that line, because you know what's going to happen. You know there's yep. going to be a reaction, retribution, uh, you know that that hazing, even like that bullying. It's like, yo, this is not what men do, and that's like you said, this is what shapes us, even all the way through our lives." Yeah. And I mean, in, in high school, really, we've got two driving motivations. One is to not be seen as female. One is to not be seen as gay. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's really, and that's backed up by research, but let, let me ask you a question, Steve. Do you have kids? I have one nine-year-old son. Okay. Um, I was going to see if you had a daughter, but no, one of the no, things I that, have six sisters, if that counts. Okay. Well, that'll help. So um, one of the things that really bothers me about this whole dynamic is the impact that it has on young girls growing up. So think about the the biggest, I would say, the well, there's probably four biggest insults we can get. You're gay, so we'll put that to the side for now. You're a pussy, bitch, little girl. Mm -hmm. So those three, those last three, are the essence of femininity. I mean, pussy equals vagina, right? Yeah. Bitch equals girl, girl equals girl. And... <laughs> Those are the worst things that we can be called. Now, check this out. The little girls around the boys, middle school, high school, the girls and boys, the girls are hearing these insults too. And every time they hear those insults, it tells them that they are less than. You're 100% right. And it comes. And it, it came from everywhere. I mean, even people yeah. that we maybe looked up to. I mean, one yeah. of my favorite movies, The Karate Kid. Mr. Miyagi tells Danielson, come on, what are you, some kind of girl or something? Yeah. Oh, yeah, like, you'll see it everywhere now. And we love Mr. Miyagi, you know? And yeah, he was, yeah, he was awesome. Yeah, and it, but even those little things, like you said, they get internalized by everyone hearing them, whether they're girl or boy, whatever, you know, whoever. It's, it's everywhere. All you have to do is look, and you're going to see it. Yeah. Well, and, and here's the other thing that kind of interests me about this whole thing. You know, in doing some of these interviews, I've had co-hosts kind of challenge me and say, you know, well, some people would say you're arguing for the wussification of men. I mean, All right. I would disagree, yeah, but go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll, and and I'm, I'm, I, I hear the question. I hear the point. Mm -hmm. And that's not what I'm arguing for. What I am arguing for is to, I want all men out there to have the ability to shift gears. I, I want them to have the ability to be stereotypically masculine when it serves them and the people around them, and then be able to shift into a kinder, gentler, more communicative, more sympathetic, supportive version of themselves when they need to be that as well. So if you're playing rugby, be a badass, be yeah. tough, be aggressive, be invincible. That serves you, that works. But if you're going home and dealing with your five-year-old daughter who just skinned her knee, you need to be sympathetic, you need to be gentle, you need to be quiet. So it's it's about the ability to shift gears and assume the the emotional qualities that serve you and your loved ones best in the moment. Yeah. Well, I've been, I've been doing a little reading myself about like the man box and man box mm -hmm. culture over the last few years. And it seems like a lot of guys out there kind of fundamentally misunderstand what the message is. Like you're saying, it's not that we want to erase all these, you know, these emotions, these things that we have historically con uh, considered masculine. Mm -hmm. We want to, let men know that you're a human being. There's a huge spectrum of emotions and you shouldn't be limited to these yeah. three particular ones. You're basically crippling yourself emotionally, uh, you know, as a child and you're not being a full human being, you know, mm -hmm. like one of the things I've seen, which always drove me crazy was, you know, when you would always hear about this whole toxic masculinity conversation in the media, a lot of times on social media, and a meme that I saw floating around was it was a picture of soldiers during World War II, you know, and on D-Day. And it says, you know, the toxic masculinity saving the day once again. And it struck me. It's like, no, you don't you're not getting it. That's not how this mm -hmm. works. Guys going out there to fight for, you know, liberating oppressed people. That's not toxic. You know, that's not even necessarily just masculine. That's just mm -hmm. a good, positive thing. And you're misunderstanding what the message is. You know, do you find that that's something that happens a lot that you've fought against? Yeah, I, I agree. And and here's the thing that's I, I agree. Absolutely. And, and the thing that's funny about it is so. 
and, and I, I hate the phrase toxic masculinity, by the way. Mm -hmm. and I, here's I do why, <clears throat> because if you, if you bring that up in a conversation with another man, it shuts them down immediately. Definitely. Yes. Like immediately puts them on the defensive immediately. It's like, fuck you internally. Mm -hmm. And you get nowhere with it. And it's not about the individual. It's about the culture. Mm -hmm. And if you keep the conversation at a cultural level, I think it allows more people to look at it with curiosity and go, huh, maybe. And it's interesting. There's a, there was um, a comment made or a quote made by an actor on the West Wing, um, Bradley, and I forget his last name. Oh, Bradley Sorry Whitworth. Sorry about that, Bradley. Yes, thank you, Whitworth. Yes, okay, I love so that show. This guy had a brilliant comment. He said, when I get feedback from a director, I go through three internal responses. The first one is, fuck you. The second is, I suck. And the third one is, wait, what? Now, that is brilliant because it boils it down, our responses to this, to the essence. And I think it's absolutely true that first you get externalized anger, fuck you. Mm -hmm. Second, you get internalized anger, oh, I'm a shitty person. And third, you, you can look at the feedback with some openness. And I think it's the same thing to this conversation for men. At first, they're angry at you. Second, they're angry at themselves. And then they can go, wait, maybe he's got a point. But, you know, because our primary emotion is anger, the, the whole anger dynamic is if I stay angry enough, nothing is my fault. If I'm angry with you and we're in an argument, I'm going to externalize all blame onto you. It's all your fault. If only you would stop being such an asshole, I'd be fine. <laughs> And, and it's the same thing in this discussion about man box culture that it's a very, it's a very, it's a slog because most of the men are angry and understand when I say angry, there's degrees of anger on a one to 10 scale, right? So mm -hmm. you can be slightly irritated, but every time this topic comes up, a lot of men get a little bit annoyed. Fuck, here we go again. Yeah. Well, you, you hit and, the nail on the head. You said certain like buzzwords or phrases just make people shut down. Yeah. And one of the things that, that I love about doing the show is that it has such a diverse audience. And I feel like this is like the niche. This is where a lot of people aren't really trying to reach guys where they're at. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are just talking at us saying, oh, well, you men did this and, you know, men did that. And it's. A lot of guys just shut down when they hear that. They yeah. feel attacked. Can't do it. Yeah. So, it, oh, go ahead. Where you? Oh, well, I was going to say that, I mean, I've thought a lot about how to reach men, how to get them to look at this honestly and openly with curiosity and non-judgment. Because that's, that's really what I want to do is like, let's just have a conversation about this where no one is to blame. Because as soon as you put blame out there, we're like, fuck you. Yep. And, and so if we can just have a conversation about this and, and think honestly without judgment about it, I think we have a real shot at changing the minds of a large number of men. And, and I think, you know, it's funny because I think men at some level are desperate for this and resistant to it simultaneously. Because, you know, we were talking about loneliness and we want to get into that subject later, but I really think this, this whole man box culture fuels loneliness and disconnection among men yeah i've seen it myself um especially right now so many people are stuck home you know that's only amplifying the whole thing but it's yeah. like you said men kind of find themselves in a position now where they're not always needed you know they're kind of struggling to find their footing where do i fit in what's my role and how can i have a relationship with somebody who doesn't actually need me around you know and a lot of guys i feel like Maybe they find themselves in situations where maybe they're not the best looking or they're not in the best shape and they they don't know what they have to offer and they don't know how to become desirable. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So, uh, and I think that that's directly led to loneliness in a lot of guys. And like you said, a lot of guys are resistant to hearing you know what people like you have to say. But yeah. they might, like you said, also desperately need it at the same time. So what would you say is a your approach to reaching out to guys who maybe have, have the walls up and aren't that. I, you open. know, I, I think the big one is trying to approach as a man that can be masculine and at the same time, talk about these difficult subjects. I think the other part of it is 
knowing the dynamics of most men, and, and these are emotional dynamics that I'm talking about, so knowing how anger works, because I'm kind of an anger management expert. <laughs> um, and so how do you get past the anger in order to be listened to? I think part of it is letting men know that it's not their fault. None of this is their fault. They didn't ask to be socialized this way. It just happened. And so I think that takes a big part of the responsibility off of our shoulders. And then the responsibility I want to put back in its place is let's look at this stuff with honesty and compassion and non-judgment and, and just see, like, one of the things I put on social media, I don't know, last year was a series, I tried to pick a series of stereotypical masculine traits. And there's a lot of good in traditional masculinity. Of course. I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm saying there's, there's a lot of good to it. And there's some things where I'm like, maybe we went too far with this. And, and how about if we look at it and just kind of dial it back a little bit? And, and let me give you a, an example. So, um, well, I, I gave you one example with the be a provider for your family. Okay. Where, you know, many of us take it too far. Think of these on a one to 10 scale. And I think on most of them, you want to have some moderation. So maybe shoot for a four to six or a five to seven on a 10 point scale. But a lot of times we go to a 10 and then we're like, I don't know, why is my wife mad at me? But another example would be like self-reliance, right? Okay. We get socialized to be an army of one. Yes. Rely on myself. I don't ask for help. I don't ask for directions. I don't need any help. And that can be a problem when you don't reach out for help when you actually need it. Say you're depressed after coming out of a marriage or you're bummed out because your business just failed or you're struggling with anxiety. I mean, any of these, I mean, there's a lot of ways we can ask for help. Just, I'm, I'm drinking too much. Um, and so self-reliance. I mean, I remember I had a friend whose dad pulled his own teeth in the garage with pliers when they were rotting because I, you know, and I think there was a fear of going to the dentist, but my dad was the dentist. I'm like, dude, go to the dentist, you know him. But that's kind of this sick example of being overly self-reliant. That's a 10 or an 11. And so I, I think to look at some of these traits honestly and say, where do I want to be? What traits do I want to include in my version of masculinity? And where do I want to be on a one to 10 scale? Not with anyone calling me a pussy or a fag or anything like that, but where do I want to be? What, what suits me the best? What serves my relationships best? Because I do think self-reliance is a great trait, but I don't want to be a nine or a 10 on that scale. I want to be able to ask for help when I need it. And I need, I need it a lot more than I thought I did. Yeah, don't we all? Excuse me. Oh, these coffee yeah. really doing a number on me <laughs> good coffee then oh i made it myself thank you <laughs> so we mentioned loneliness and this is something i wanted to get into a lot of men like we said find themselves lonely and it's been my experience i lived alone for nine years straight so i noticed sometimes that isolation it really starts to kind of warp your way of thinking you know a, a lot of times all that that looking inward can become very negative and a lot of guys i think especially now with the advent of you know the internet and social media you find these groups and you you find these ideologies that maybe sound good but can really be insidious in the way that they they take what could be a logical idea and turn it into something negative you know they're mm -hmm. redirecting blame you know like you see this this red pill ideology is big online uh, you know the the MGTOW, men going their own way. You see anti-feminists. A lot of times it's the anti-anti something. Like feminism would be like <laughs> anti-oppression. Yeah. Anti and then the anti-feminism is like a whole other thing. And it pushes you back to the original thing, to the, to the oppression idea. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So what have you kind of noticed in your travels about the way loneliness has been affecting guys now in the modern world? Well... I think the first thing to say is there's a difference between being alone and feeling lonely because you can be alone and not feel lonely. Some of us are very good at being alone, but it becomes problematic where you start to feel lonely or perceive yourself as feeling lonely. And, and that's where problems ensue. And I was looking up the, uh, there's a loneliness study by Cigna in 2020 and they found that half of the U.S. 
reported feeling sometimes or always lonely. Those are staggering numbers. And, you know, one in five people reported, I'm just reading these, one in five reported rarely or never feeling close to another person, 20%. And, you know, it's Generation Z, those ages 18 to 22, reported the highest loneliness scores, 48%, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the, the greater generation, ages 72 and above, feel, they reported the least loneliness, 38%. But of men, 46% reported feeling sometimes or always lonely. That's brutal. The big numbers. And, and so we were bigger, we were, and in fact, more men were lonely than women. And I think women are socialized, you know, the, the stress response, and we found this out in, in science, the stress response differs to an extent for men than for women. When men get stressed, it's the traditional fight, flight, freeze response that you've probably heard of. When women get stressed, it's a tend or befriend response, which means they tend to the young or they go in groups to seek support from other, typically other women. And so that's an interesting difference. So women at a biological genetic level, they tend to be more social. They tend to function in relationship. And so I would say as a rule, they tend to be more advanced than us in communication skills and relationship skills. And, you know, we tend to think, and then, you know, it goes back to that self-reliance, that army of one, I don't ask for help. So instead of talking to a friend or reaching out and saying, hey, I could really use some support right now, or, you know, calling up that college friend that you haven't talked to for 10 or 15 or 20 years, we'll just suffer it out in silence. We gut it out. Yes. Some of us are and, better at it than others. I, I have, I'm part Irish, so we're, we're champions yeah. at that. <laughs> well, yeah, and I think part of it is we have this, um, or let me put it in my, I think part of it was I had this, um, I don't even know how to describe it, like this, um, uh, okay, it's a, um, sorry. No, no worries. It's sort of like being, um, sacrificed or crucified there's a tragedy to my loneliness right that's kind of like if only someone would come and save me yes but i'm not going to reach out and i remember i had a i had a high school student a while back that this was years ago but he had this really odd to me rule about texting okay he was like i just wait for people to text me i don't text anybody first i was like how come he's like well that way i know that they're thinking about me and I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess that must feel nice for you. What about when you think about them, do you want them to feel that same positive emotional boost? You know, it was this odd kind of, I'm not reaching out to anybody. Yeah. Because that way I know I matter. So there's this arrogance and ego attached to it as well. That's interesting. I mean, I know I'm, I'm probably guilty as a person of not being the best with, in terms of, you know, <clears throat> being on the phone, reaching out to people if I haven't heard from them in a while. But uh, yeah, it really shows like that just thoughtlessness of like, oh, well, no, I want people to reach out to me. I'm not going to go out of my way to make anybody else maybe feel better. You know what I, I mean? It's directionality. And one of the things I've always taught my younger clients is, look, a good relationship should be bi-directional. In other words, good stuff should be going both ways at times. I mean, you know, at times you're going to be struggling and things are going to be going bad, but what do you get that's positive out of the relationship and what are you giving? And you know, it's funny. I remember I came out of my divorce and, and I, and I think this is pretty typical for a lot of men. I had lost touch with a lot of my male friends. I did not put, put much effort into sustaining them while I was married and raising my children, partly because I was just so damn busy, but partly because I would get into this trap and I've seen this over and over and over with other men I would get into this trap of, oh, I don't want to call Alan. You know, I haven't talked to him in 10 years. What if he's like angry when I call him? Yeah. What if he's like, what, what if he's upset? Jerk, right. What, what if he's hurt? Want? Yeah. And, and so I don't call. And then after the, the divorce, I started reaching out to all my male friends and all my male friends were happy to hear from me. And I, I think we, so we get in that trap of, oh, you know, I don't want to reach out because they don't want to hear from me or, you know, whatever, whatever story we're telling ourselves, but it's negative. And I think there's also that fear of embarrassment and a fear of rejection. Definitely. 
hundred percent. And and those hamstring us. And so I just want to tell anyone out there that's listening, go call your fucking old friends. They would love to hear from you. I promise. And don't call them. And if they don't, have them talk to me. Yeah. Well, I say more even to to compound that. Don't call them when you need something. Call them just to catch up. That, yeah. I think, is a big difference. Because especially if yeah. you hear from someone you haven't heard from in years, and the first thing they're doing is asking for something, that's going to be met with apprehension and you know, yeah. suspicion. And I think all you have to do is call up and say, hey, man, how are you doing? Like, yeah. I was just thinking of you, and I just wanted to catch up. Just reach and, out. And part of a lot of guys that I talk to get anxious about this stuff, right? And mm-hmm. completely understandable. It's That's been me in the past. But I, I think one of the ways to get past that is to remind yourself that you're only responsible for one half of the conversation. So once you start the conversation, and this is true of approaching a woman in a bar or calling an old friend, you just have to start it out with, hey, man, how you doing? You know, I noticed you across the bar. I thought you were really pretty. Just wanted to say hi. Or, hey, man, how you doing? I was just thinking about you. I hadn't talked for years. Just wanted to catch up. Then they're going to respond with something, and you don't know what they're going to say. They could want to talk about zebras in Africa. Well, then you just respond to that. So you're only, res- I mean, just remind yourself that you're only responsible for half the conversation. No, I think that's and I think great that advice. takes a lot of the weight off. Definitely. So one of the things is that, uh, you know, I get to talk to a lot of different men from a lot of different places. And the reason that the loneliness thing rang so true to me is I know a lot of guys, a lot of single guys, you know, I feel like they, we have this front that you know listen we don't need a relationship ah, i just want to play the field but in reality it's like yeah. you know you're sitting home every night saying please send me someone jesus you know <laughs> and i know that that was true for me for a long time before i met my my now wife and uh i always wonder how can you reach out to a guy like this because a lot of times these are nice guys they maybe just mm-hmm. don't have that you know that little push they need to just get out there and talk to someone you know, and maybe like you, like we said before, they feel self conscious about one thing or the other. Like, what can be done for guys like this? Because I know a lot of them are probably too proud to even admit that this might be an issue. Well, I, my mind goes a couple of ways on that one, so I'll try and remember both directions. <laughs> um, the first one is that I've talked to hundreds of guys about this, and one of the things I'll do is I'll self reveal first. Okay. So I will talk about the fact that. Um, like I need emotional connection to have good sex, sex that I'm proud of, sex that I'm, I can think fondly of the next day. Mm-hmm. That you know I've tried doing one night stands, and afterwards I always feel kind of uh, guilty, bad, dirty. It just doesn't, it doesn't fit me. And you know, for many years I thought I was the only man that felt things deeply, especially like a, in high school. <laughs> but since doing this work, I found that 95% of the men I talk to are exactly the same. They all say, yeah, I, I would prefer having an emotional connection to someone that I'm having sex with. I want to be in a relationship, having sex and getting better at it with someone. And, you know, ideally with good communication around it. So it's always been interesting to me that most men say they regret their first time because of what didn't mean anything mm-hmm. and that they want emotional connection for really good sex. Um, so for you, right and, on you know, the money, that is, right on the money right now. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and, and I think so just to know that that seems to be the norm for men. So you're not abnormal for thinking that way or feeling that way, that the vast majority of men are the same. So that's the big deal to me. Yeah. That's... Um, the, the other part of it, I think is, so if that's the case, how do you approach? Mm-hmm. Because I, I think a lot of men are, afraid of rejection, afraid of being embarrassed. Um, well, I feel and, like that's you know, our biggest fear as men, is that fear of embarrassment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think you're right. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I do to talk about this and try and bring the anxiety level down is to ask my male clients, so what are you attracted to in a, in a woman? What, what, what do you think is really hot or sexy? Like, who do you see as an attractive woman? Give me their traits. You know, what if, you know, their eyebrows or what if, what if she has a unibrow? Is that a deal killer for you? What if she's too, what if she's taller than you? What if she's heavier than you? What if she has a big nose? What if she has, I don't know, asymmetrical eyes? You know, what if you can't stand her voice? What if if you can't stand her laugh? Right. And so I, I go through kind of some of these traits and they're like, 
oh yeah, like I, I couldn't do that. Or yeah, I, I, no, that's a deal killer. I, could, I couldn't I date say, okay. someone missing a toe because I'm lactose yeah. intolerant. Yeah. <laughs> and, but the, the purpose of it is to look at the idea that we, we are always judging people on physical appearance and to pick out someone that we think is attractive, we can eliminate people on the most superficial of things. And that's okay. I, I mean, I, I have no problem with that. I think that's how we initially are attracted to someone. And then we get further into it, right? And, mm -hmm. and deeper connection. But I, I tell them, look, understand that women are doing the same thing to you that you're doing to them. So you could be eliminated because your eyebrows aren't thick enough. And that has nothing to do with you. It has to do with their preferences. Mm -hmm. So if you can flip it and realize that rejection when dating isn't so much about you most of the time, it's about what they're looking for. Then it, it, it lowers the stakes in rejection. You're more able to approach. And, you know, because to me, really, it's amazing that we can find anyone we find attractive because there's just, there's so many things that we eliminate people on. Especially as we get older too, we learn more of the things that are deal breakers for us. So yeah. we just learn to eliminate more people from those, that potential yeah. list. Um, and, and then you can go like, you can break it up if, if you're not good or comfortable approaching women in public, like in a bar or restaurant or something, then go more into the online dating and, and hone your game there and learn, like try out different profiles, try a funny one, try a values driven one, try to say what you're looking for in a woman, try to say what your values are, but then also change the pictures, make sure you got good photos up there, photos of you alone, but then photos of you having fun but then also learn how to do that initial connection via the direct messaging. And then how quickly do you transition to phone? Because you know you don't wanna to wait too long DMing on a, on a date site because the woman's gonna go like, oh geez, she's never gonna ask after a week. Yeah, of course. And it's very you know, different so you know, with the men's you know, messages and the female's messages, because I'm sure females are generally inundated with messages from all these right. horny guys and the guys were, you know, we have that famine mentality. It's like, Oh, I got one. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the other thing is have a, an abundance mentality, not a scarcity mentality. So don't be so de desperate that you're willing to hold on to the first woman that pays you attention, but understand that there's thousands of women out there that could be potentially a great mate for you. Absolutely. I think now, that's a big one too. One of the things I've heard you uh, speak about on your show is emotional intelligence. And I think this ties in nicely to this topic because it's like we said, there's a lot of guys who maybe, you know, haven't been with a with a female in, in some time and you get rusty, so to speak, or you just don't have those muscles built up. You know what I mean? So well, how would you mm -hmm. how would you explain emotional intelligence, what that concept means? Emotional intelligence is um the first part is emotional awareness. So knowing what you are feeling in the moment. And to do that, we got to get out of our heads and into our body. I mean, put our attention on what's going on internally in your body. So each emotion has a tell. So for instance, if my chest is getting tight, I'll go, okay, I'm getting anxious. Like what's going on that's making me anxious. Or if I feel my heart rate go up quickly, I'm like, okay, I'm starting to get angry. Like what's pissing me off right now? So there's tells for each of these that you can immediately begin to identify what it is you are feeling. And I think it's a really good challenge for men to work on that because, and I'll just throw this out to uh, appeal to the competitiveness in them. <laughs> Some studies show that women can name 17 emotions on average. We're at about eight. So when a woman asks you how you're feeling and you're like, good, bad, I don't know, <laughs> that's not attractive. Yeah. So we need to work on um, distinguishing more emotions, getting more emotional depth, emotional literacy, having the words to attach to how we're feeling. So just knowing what we're feeling is a big one. And then knowing how to communicate what you're feeling is a big one. And then the other part of it is kind of me knowing what you're feeling and how to communicate what you're feeling or with you about what you're feeling. So it's about spotting emotions in other people. And that's mostly empathy. Okay. That's yeah. That's something I feel like a lot of men are are extremely lacking in, as far as you know. That goes right back to the man box culture. That empathy is you know, uh, historically. Well, uh, I, you know, oh, go ahead. it's funny. I think I think there's a lot of men with the raw. Sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of men with the raw ability to do it. I think 
we, we just haven't been encouraged to do it. I agree. Okay, that, that's fair. So one of the reasons I bring up the emotional intelligence is because that I, I think it I feel like it ties right into our social skills and, you know, being aware of how we're being perceived by the other person involved. So in the area of dating and romance, a lot of times I feel like men don't realize the signals they're sending and they don't realize the vibes they're putting out and how they're being received by the women we're interested in. And a lot of guys tend to shoot themselves in the foot in exactly this way. You don't realize, oh, you know, you calling her six times, that looks creepy, right? It doesn't look like you're being persistent or you're being, you know, interested. You're coming off like a weirdo and that's hurting you, not helping you. And it's a lot of guys don't seem to have that awareness of those signals that they're sending out. Now, is this something that you've seen with clients, you know, guys that you're that you coach or that you deal with? Yeah, I think that I think you're absolutely right. And it's funny because there's a lot of subtleties to it. Like what you're talking about, like if you're talking to a woman in a bar, you have to be aware of physical distance. How much are you leaning into it? How much is she leaning into it or leaning away from you? You know, and, and so if she's leaning away from you, you're not getting the right signals. Yeah. If, if she's, you know, meeting distance with you and twirling her hair and biting her lower lip, that means she's, there's some signs of interest there. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of subtleties to this. And part of it is developing empathy. And, and empathy is basically the ability to feel what the other person is feeling. It's syncing with them. And <clears throat> part of this, again, goes back to your ability to tune into your own body to know what it is you're feeling so that you can have a prayer of picking up what the other person is feeling. And, and part of this is nonverbal cues, but part of this is picking up actually what they're feeling using mirror neurons, which are neurons in our brain that activate based on what the other person is feeling, and it shows up in our body. And so it, it's interesting because like, I'll tell anxious people, like let's say I had a guy that was, um, in college and he would get anxious going into his own fraternity parties. And I said, okay, so what I want you to do is when you walk up to the door of the house, take a couple deep breaths, focus on your body, relax your heart rate, bring it down so that you know you're centered and relatively calm and then walk into the house. Now, when you start having a conversation with someone and you start to feel anxious, interpret it as their anxiety. I don't care what the truth is. What I want you to do is pick the interpretation that serves you best. It's a good way to look at it. Hey, Doc, do you mind, could we pause for about sure. two minutes real quick? I need to run, use the, the restroom. This yep. coffee is doing its trick. I will be right back. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So by the magic of editing, we're back. Um, we were talking about emotional intelligence, social skills, mm -hmm. social awareness. Uh, I feel like a lot of the things that you're talking about is reading these cues, these social cues, these physical, uh, you know, these little tells, like you said. I've seen guys take those things and twist it, you know, that whole pickup artist, you know, approach. They think, oh, if I, you know, know all these little moves and these little subtleties that she does, I can pick up a woman and I could kind of trick her into thinking. Have you have you seen this? Like how how misguided is this really? Yeah, I mean, I think when I first got uh, separated, I guess I read The Game by Neil Strauss, um, which is all about, you know, pickup artists, the best pickup artists all around the world and a fascinating read. And I just kind of went through it and sorted out the good from the bad. Mm -hmm. And I think there was about, I don't know, 10, 15% good and a lot of crap in there. <laughs> I mean, peacocking, right? Like I'm going to wear a big hat and a monocle and a yellow scarf so that people notice me. <clears throat> that was one approach yeah. or negs. You know, I'm going to give a, a compliment that's not really a compliment to make her feel bad about herself. Like that's, that's messed up to me. Um, that's preying on people's insecurities to use them. So that's manipulation. Uh, I think that, you know, the ideal is to go about these things authentically and responsibly and with radical honesty, because I guess it depends what you're looking to do. If you're looking to just get laid, I mean, I still don't think it's ethical, but you know, I, 
but if you're looking for a relationship, I think you definitely want to go at this transparently, honestly, openly, um, because that's the best way to start the foundation of a good relationship. I agree. I mean, that was kind of my approach just by default, because I'm not good at being anybody else. Um, and my wife has told me, you know, for the, the years we've been together, like that was one of the things that attracted her to me is that, you know, she's from Miami, uh, which is a city where there's a ton of beautiful people. Everybody's trying to outdo the next person. And I've mm-hmm. talked about it on the show. It's kind of like a city of uh, super predators, so to speak. Everybody's everybody's yeah. a, you know, an alpha predator. So we all not to say that people are predators, but you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so everybody's trying to compete and. It's like that realness, just being honest about who you are. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm me. I'm just some five, six guy from New Jersey, you know, with no hairline anymore. Uh, just being honest can go such a long way and can be refreshing to a lot of people who are used to seeing yeah. people maybe with that pickup artist mentality, you know, trying to drive the, the flashy car or have the, the big Dr. Seuss hat, like the guy that used to have the show on VH1. <laughs> You know, yeah, I, I think that, you know, I live up in Northern California outside of San Francisco and, you know, growing up, I had cousins down in L.A. And I've always had a love hate relationship with Southern California. I love it. I went to school down there. I love the sun. I love the beaches. I love some of the people. And there's a lot of plastic people down there. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are overly concerned with appearance and materialism. And if that's what you want, okay, cool, go for that. And I don't think that it leads to high quality, authentic, emotionally connected relationships. So, I mean, it kind of depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for, you know, wealth and plastic, cool, go for that. But I I think it's misguided. I, I think that ultimately every person on this planet is looking for happiness and i think we go about it different ways some people pursue wealth some pursue fame some pursue power some look to serve others there's different values that can lead us there and i think i'm biased but i definitely think some are better than others and some won't get you there at all yeah well i mean just playing that game that whole dating game especially online dating the tinder world and everything a lot of guys if you've felt rejection maybe once too many times or you kind of feel like you're trapped in a hamster wheel and and it's kind of like an unfair system so to speak like it's a rigged game uh it leads to bitterness and anger you know and it's we as men we tend to direct it outwards instead of saying what am i doing wrong what can i do differently it's like well they are responsible because they're rejecting me and they're making me feel less than you know and that's i feel like that's how the whole red pill ideology comes about Mm -hmm. is these guys feel like they're playing a rigged game and they they blame women basically for Mm -hmm. making them feel small making them feel unworthy right you know and i i feel like that can be really harmful stuff because a lot of guys seem to be drawn in by it and I, i personally i don't get it you know but that's just me i my experience is very different from a lot of men no, I, I think you're on point. I've I've talked to a couple of men that are in the Magtown movement, in you know white nationalist movements, mm-hmm. um, and I, I do think those are fueled by anger and fear and and nostalgia. A lot of times, you know, longing to be back in the 1950s in a white America where men and women knew their place. Um, and and I do think anger drives a lot of this. And I think you're right that a lot of men are approaching women repeatedly, getting rejected repeatedly which leads to hurt. I think that's the underlying emotion. And then quickly on top of that is anger. And, you know, one of the goals I think in this lifetime of ours is to learn to have greater resiliency, to learn to open your heart up repeatedly to people and the world while knowing full well that you are going to get hurt again and again and again. And the goal is to continue to open up your heart each time. Now, I don't mean open yourself up to be abused repeatedly. Very important. I'm talking about opening yourself up to mostly good, mostly honest people, which I think most of the people out there are. That's a, 
that reminds me of a quote I've heard about what true love actually is. It's, you know, giving someone the power to destroy you and trusting that they won't use it. Yeah. You know, and it's it's scary. I mean, I'm sure you and I can both scary agree. as hell. Yeah, we can both agree when it doesn't when it doesn't go well, when it when it doesn't work out, it hurts like hell. And it really, you know, it takes a toll on you. And so a lot of guys, it's like your heart is that piece of paper or a bad thing happens. A little piece gets ripped off and a bad thing happens here. Another piece gets ripped off and eventually you're left with just, you know, confetti. And it's hard for a lot of guys to to come back from that. You know, I, I've been through it plenty of times and it, it hurts yeah. and it it changes you, I feel like, in some way. Like, is there is there a way back for guys like this? You know, where that bitterness really just solidified and calcified in them, you know? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I think that one of the ways that I think about emotion is as us having two buckets. So you've got a bucket of positive emotion and a bucket of negative emotion. Okay. And if you think of each of those buckets on a one to 10 scale, what we're trying to do is fill the bucket of positive emotion up as often as we can. Um, we need more positive emotion to offset negative emotion. Negative emotions are stronger, they're louder, they yell at us. We know damn well when we're angry. Mm -hmm. We know when we're sad, we know when we're stressed. The positive emotions on the other hand are fleeting, fragile, quiet, they whisper to us. So we have to put conditions in our life to cultivate positive emotions frequently throughout the day. But then if you take that bucket metaphor and you can apply it to different relationships in your life and realize that the buckets are at different levels for each relationship. So let's say you're angry at your wife. Let's say you're irritated, just like you're, you're in a bad stretch, right? So your negative buckets at a six and your positive buckets at a two. Well, when you go into an interaction with her and you're at that state, that interaction probably isn't going to go very well. Whereas if it's flipped, it's going to go great. If you're at a six positive and a two negative, but then you can also have those buckets of emotion for groups of people, mm -hmm. women, um, men, Republicans, Democrats, that kind of thing. And I can go on and on and on, mm -hmm. but you get the idea. So if, and I think that some of these young men, their negative buckets at like a nine or a 10 and the positive buckets at a one with regards to women. Mm -hmm. And that's the lens through which they see women. So now all women become the enemy. All women become people that are out to hurt them. So they're not even going to give them the chance they're going to just use the anger to repel them and keep them at bay. So back to your question of how do you deal with that? One of the big practices or ideas is how do you empty out that bucket of negative emotion? And I would say that one of the best tools that I've found is the daily practice of forgiveness. And this is Fred Luskin's work out of Stanford, but basically it's the idea that you can forgive anybody for pretty much anything. You have to be willing you have to practice it daily. It doesn't feel right or normal at first. You know, you feel like, I don't, I don't want to forgive them. Yeah. But you do it anyway. And over time, your heart begins to soften to that person or that group. And, you know, these people could forgive the people that the women that have rejected them, each woman, for example. Um, and over time, the, the little angers and hurts and resentments and annoyances kind of drop off your list but the bigger ones remain. And so you keep kind of practicing forgiveness. Now, to give you the background, Fred um, kind of reconceptualized forgiveness. His book is called Forgive for Good. If you want to check it out, I highly recommend it. So he broke it down into steps and then he broke it down into the areas where we get stuck on forgiveness. So for instance, one of the areas is um, we confuse an unforgivable offense with an unwillingness to forgive. What does that mean? It means that I see something like I see this rejection from this woman is so baseless that I could never forgive that. That is not forgivable. Well, that's not true. It is forgivable. I'm just saying it's unforgivable. It's choosing not to. Um, and, and what the other one is we don't forgive to condone or approve of what happened. Forgiveness doesn't mean you approve. You merely forgive to let go of that old stale anger. And, you know, Fred kind of taught these skills to parents in Ireland 
who had lost their children to bombings and got them to forgive the murderers of their children. Then he went to inner city neighborhoods in the US and worked with parents to forgive the murderers of their children due to gangland violence, thereby proving that everything is forgivable. And the host of benefits that they got from forgiving the murderers of their children were huge. It was like more frequent positive emotions, less anger, less guilt, less shame, less sadness, less depression, less anxiety. I, I mean, the, the list went on and on and on. Um, so forgiveness is really the biggest one that I could argue. And I don't know, I've got an article about how to forgive. I, I kind of boiled it down to three pages, but it, it might be on my site, guide to self.com. I'm really not sure. Um, I, it's somewhere, but I've also got, actually I worked on a, um, a mini course for forgiveness and I, I did it for simple habit. They asked me to make five minute classes and to make seven of them. And it was really, really hard to boil down like research lesson meditation into five minutes. So I did it, there were like eight minutes each, but I've got seven, eight minute audio classes that you can purchase on my site. I think it's 20 bucks or something, or you can go to Simple Habit. It's available on Simple Habit. Um, there's one on forgiveness and there's one on anger management. And those two classes alone have been listened to by over a hundred thousand people, which is great. No, I mean, that is a really powerful thing is forgiveness and, you know, some people, I think, look at it like weakness, like, oh, you can forgive somebody who did that to you. But really, it's the it requires the most strength, you know, and it does. It also goes back. There was a the saying that, you know, holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You know? Yeah, I think that was Buddha. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and what happens is we have I think so we've to the best of my knowledge, I like the internal family systems theory where we've got multiple use inside you. So for instance, for me, I've got a five-year-old John inside my head. That's kind of the one that throws the tantrum. And then I've got like a 15-year-old kind of angry, rebellious John in there. And then I've got the functional adult John in there. And I think this is a really good theory to look at where am I, where am I right now and how am I behaving? Um, and so I think that with anger and you know, like we're talking about rejection with women, I think that that five-year-old comes out and is kind of throwing a tantrum. And what we're doing is we're being angry, we're holding on to old anger at someone that doesn't know or doesn't care that we are angry. So we're kind of holding on to this magical thinking, like by me holding on to my anger at this woman, I'm going to somehow magically punish her for what she yeah. did to me. And she doesn't know, no, nor does she care. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, all we're doing is hurting ourselves by holding on to that anger. So then the question is, how do we let it go? And forgiveness is the best way I know of. I Listen, I think that that is sound advice. And I think a lot of guys would really do well to, to heed what you're saying here. Uh, so we're getting close to the end here. The, the last thing I want to go over is uh, this segment I do on the show now called Humble Pie. Now, we, uh, I, I sent you the email about it. What I like to do is just have myself and the guests tell an embarrassing story just because it kind of it humbles us sometimes we need to be humbled mm. and a lot of times hearing those embarrassing stories reminds us like hey this shit happens to everyone you know so i have one I i'm gonna share mine first this one is locked and loaded this is something that it's embarrassing now maybe not as embarrassing at the time it happened but it's something i'm i'm actually ashamed of it's some some mm. bad behavior that uh you know, I, I've really kind of kicked myself in the ass for over the years. So when I was around 20, 21, I was dating a girl. We dated for about a year. And, uh, you know, I, I really didn't have the emotional maturity that, you know, a 35-year-old man would have. And I felt like, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing for me. We're just, we're not the best couple. I don't feel in it. And I decided I wanted to end it. But the problem was that I didn't have the balls to just, tell her that to just say listen I don't think this is going to work out like I'm sorry if you know if I wasted your time I just want to I think we should go our separate ways instead I had the brilliant idea to just maybe I'll just act like an asshole and she'll dump me and that'll you know free me of the burden of having to initiate a painful conversation so what actually instead happened was that I acted like an asshole and I ended up hurting someone who really didn't do anything to deserve it and 
you know, I've lived with that that shame for a while. I've since, you know, years ago, I, I went, I was going through a tough time in life, and I was thinking about all the bad things I did, and I actually reached out and called this girl, you know, years after it had happened, and just apologized, like, listen, you know, I really acted like a dick, and you didn't deserve that, and I'm sorry. Like, I don't want anything from you. I just wanted you to know that I was really wrong for doing that. And, you know, she she accepted my apology. I'm sure, you know, she she didn't disagree with what I was saying to her. But that was something I was really ashamed of. I'm still ashamed of it to this day. And the reason I bring that up is I feel like a lot of guys, you need to hear this, like, don't avoid the painful conversation. If you feel like it's going to be uncomfortable, it's probably because it really needs to happen. You really need to have that conversation. So that's my embarrassing story. That's my humble pie for today. Doc, you're up. Yeah, that, that's totally on point. I mean, I think that um, it, one, of the, one of the key traits of successful people is the willingness to stay in, to start and stay in uncomfortable conversations. And, and I think that's something that we learn. I've learned as I've gotten older because I used to avoid them too. Mm-hmm. So I hear you. Um, and I, good job apologizing to her. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, took a little so heartbreak I, you know, on my own part for me to actually, you know, make, reach yeah. out and make that call. So it's funny. I've studied embarrassment for several years because like you, I had that realization. I think that much of what we do as men is to avoid embarrassment. And so I wanted to get more comfortable being embarrassed. And so I began to actively seek out feeling embarrassed, which means that I had to act like an ass in public. <laughs> So my, my family members hate me for this because it often involves them too. Um, so I remember we were, I was with my fiance and we were in Paris walking along the Seine, beautiful, you know, environment, beautiful setting. And the tour de France was actually ending in Paris that day. We didn't realize this, but we were walking from the Eiffel tower, went and had lunch on this, you know, kind of floating boat restaurant. And we had a charcuterie platter and, my, my fiance wanted mustard and we didn't know how to say mustard in <laughs> France, in French. So we turned to the lady next to us and asked her and she said, yeah, it's mutard. And that made the five-year-old in me laugh hysterically, like mutard, like that just sounds funny. Yeah. But I was really civilized and sophisticated and didn't say anything about it at that point. And then we finished lunch and we're back up on the bank of the Seine and walking along and there's armed police everywhere. There's snipers up on the tops of buildings. There's guys with AK-47s at the, you know, opening to each bridge. There's police vans blocking off roads. And I thought this would be a really good time. Uh, and forgive me for using the word. I, I apologize in advance. <laughs> I, but I started acting retarded. <laughs> and I just, you know, started- mutard, mutard, <laughs> and really loudly. Yeah. And there was a lot of people around. And my girlfriend realized what was going on and just was like, oh, shit. And she disappeared. She vanished. <laughs> she found some stairs and she was just gone. And I just, I was leaning against a tree, just la- I mean, like I was crying. I was laughing so hard. So then we, <laughs> the next day we went to Champagne and went on a uh, tour of Veuve Clicquot, which is an amazing tour if you ever have the chance. It was like a three hour tour and they, it's, it's better than anything I've done in Napa or any, any place, Sonoma, Healdsburg. And we go on this very sophisticated tour and we're with this older English couple who was a blast. And we had this young darling tour guide. And at the end of the tour, we have this amazing setup where you've got four glasses of champagne, four cheeses to pair with the champagne. So we're drinking these glasses of champagne and we're talking about them. And the English couple tells us this kind of embarrassing, funny story. And I'm like, I'm getting kind of buzzed at this point. And I'm like, well, I should tell a funny story too. So I tell the story of yesterday when we're walking along the river Seine and there's armed guards all around and it's this beautiful idyllic setting. And all of a sudden, Jory starts acting really retarded going, mutard, mutard. And I was like, I couldn't believe my fiance was acting this way. And my, my, right under the bus. <laughs> Jory, my fiance was so pissed. It was, it was great. Uh, now she can laugh at that story. Yeah. Now she asks me to tell that story. But at the time, she wasn't very happy. Yeah, but imagine. I'll do that stuff. I'll do that stuff all the time, like, you know, try and make a scene and embarrass my daughter or, and, and to her credit, they both, they've all gotten very good at it. 
Um, like I'll do silly walks in Disneyland, you know, AKA was it John Cleese from Monty Python, <laughs> just, you know, I'll make really weird, loud sounds and in, in crowds um, just to get more comfortable with embarrassment. Because what is it ultimately? It's our cheek get red. We want to withdraw and it passes in a couple minutes. That's it. Yeah. I, uh, I always feel that me and my wife have that whole competition where we try to scare each other. You know, we jump out of the closet <laughs> or something. Oh, jeez. So, and I, every time they, her or my, my son likes to get involved now too. So every time one of them gets me, it's that, oh, that initial feeling of embarrassment. Like they got me, they made yeah. me flinch, you know? And so it's, and no, I think there's, there's definitely value in uh, learning how to deal with that and realizing, listen, it's not the end of the world. You're going to be fine. Yeah. It doesn't make you less of a man to, you know, they, they made you, you know, scream. <laughs> yeah. So they're getting pretty good. My son's, my son's learning from, he's taking a few of my tricks and, uh, he's getting kind of good at it. So I can't let him, you know, I can't let him get the best of the old man, you know? Well, and then he feels pride, right? When oh, he gets of course. Here, like, he, you, yes. you never see him as happy as when he's like, I got that. I got him. <laughs> <laughs> Just got me the other day, the little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Doc, Dr. John, I am so thankful you agreed to do this. I feel like this episode, we really nailed like the main point of this whole show, of what the show is about. Like, I'm so happy that you agreed to do, to come on here, and I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, for taking the time to talk to me today. My pleasure, Steve. It was it was a blast, um, and you know, hopefully, some men will listen to it with curiosity and non judgment. Hey, I really hope that'd they be do. awesome. This is this is for those guys. If we reach one guy from this, it will have been worth our time. One hundred percent. That's what I keep telling people. If one or two people listen to the show and get something out of it, then it was worth every minute. Yep, so, I agree. Again, Doc, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh... Well, there it is. That was my conversation with Dr. John. Uh, please, by all means, make sure you follow him on Instagram at The, Evol the Evolved Caveman. You can find his website at guidetoself.com or his podcast website, theevolvedcaveman.com. Uh, like I said earlier, I really enjoyed this episode. And uh, if you can't find some nuggets of wisdom in this one, then I just don't know what to tell you. So guys out there listening, you know who you are. Some of this stuff applies to you. Listen, man, this is this is great stuff. So I thought I heard a ghost. Sorry. Uh, as always, you guys know where to find us on Instagram at A Pod Amongst Men, Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. Uh, if you have any questions, any long form stuff, stuff you want to hear on the show, send me an email, a pot amongst men at gmail.com, and I'd love to get back to you. And make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, a pot amongst men on YouTube. We're there, all the episodes are up. So make sure you like and subscribe. And you can find us on all the other streaming podcast platforms iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, everywhere you get your podcasts you will find a pot of this man. So, until next week, thank you very much, guys. Peace.